everyone, it's Karen and welcome to A Rhythm of Life. Today is going to be a little bit different because um, our district chair, Reverend Dr. Cheryl Anderson, recorded a video for Trinity Sunday and we were not able to use it at that time, um, but it's still a very good service um, and the message that she gives is, is still very relevant for us for today. So I've chosen to use her video um, as our act of worship for this morning. So I'm going to read the Bible passage that she uses and then um, we will hand over to Cheryl for her message to us. The Bible passage comes from John chapter 3 verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, you know that you are teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of he heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today is Trinity Sunday, a festival in the Christian calendar when we try, usually inadequately, to consider the question, what is God like? The Christian understanding of God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit is not easy to comprehend, let alone to preach about. Which is why the suggestion that the chair of district should record a suitable sermon for this Sunday, which could be used across the district, was met with such enthusiasm. And that is why you find me speaking to you now. Of course, the next question is which Bible passage to use. And the Nicodemus reading, which you've just heard, being so intriguing, was an easy decision. However, a number of worship leaders wanted to know which translation of the scripture to use, and that is much harder. If you look at the New Revised Standard Version, the key bit in Jesus' conversation is rendered as, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. 
if you use the NIV, it reads, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You need to know that the Greek uses the same word for above and for again. So Nicodemus misses the point Jesus is making and gets all literal and asks how one can possibly born a second, be born a second time. You see, what we do know about Nicodemus is that at this point he is afraid. He has come in the night and he is afraid. Nicodemus was Jerusalem's most outstanding scriptural scholar and teacher and a member of the Jewish ruling council. Only the high priest gained more recognition in the capital city than Nicodemus. Yet despite all his learning and privileges, he did not know God. He knew about God. He had studied the Torah and the prophets and understood in great detail the requirements of the law. In a very real sense, he had God at the center of his life. But he did not know God. Then Nicodemus meets Jesus, this smart, thoughtful, intelligent son of a carpenter. And he sees that Jesus' relationship with God is not dependent on strict observation of the law. And he begins to imagine what it might be like to reflect upon God's relationship with him. And that's very scary because God is so big and complex and not like us. I want to show you a picture. This is the most detailed image of a human cell to date. It is a three-dimensional rendering of a eucalyptic cell modeled by using radiography, x-rays, nuclear magnetic resonance, and cryo-electron microscopy, which I can barely say, let alone understand. Eukaryotic cells are so named because they have a well-protected nucleus that houses the DNA of the cell. I think it's that bit. The rest of the cell is full of membrane-bound organelles, things like this bit and these pieces here, that divide the cell into many different compartments, each with their own function. Some are chambers designed to carry out specific biochemical reactions. Others fold and package various proteins and cellular products. Some store digestive enzymes to break down incoming food. Some create stuff called adenosine triphosphate. How about that? From glucose. ATP is the chemical energy that drives processes in living cells, such as muscle contraction. All animals, plants, and fungi are made from these cells. We are made from these cells. This is a picture of us. We are all made up of variations of these cells, currently estimated at somewhere around 37.2 trillion cells in total each. To quote the psalmist, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. What is most amazing is that if you laid one of these cells in a Petri dish on its own, it wouldn't do anything. We are able to walk to the shops, praise God, sing, laugh, weep, run a marathon, eat cake, feel love, because the 37.2 trillion cells work together to make stuff happen. It seems that it is in the relationship between the cells that we exist. Here's another thing. A 
Carlo Rovelli is an Italian theoretical physicist who in this book tells the story of the birth of quantum physics and its bright young founders who were to become some of the most famous Nobel Prize winners in science. He particularly focuses on Werner Heisenberg, who in June 1925, that's nearly 100 years ago, retreated to the treeless, wind-battered island of Helgoland in the North Sea in order to think. What he wanted to think about was the physical properties of nature at the scale of atoms and subatomic particles. This was the beginning of quantum mechanics, an understanding of matter based on probabilities rather than certainties. In his book, Ravelli makes an extraordinary statement. He suggests that at the subatomic level, particles have no properties in themselves. Properties only exist in the relationships between the particles. He beautifully describes the physical world, the world we touch, as a fabric woven by relations, where we, as every other thing around us, exist in our interactions with one another. For me, all this makes perfect sense. If our God, who is creator, redeemer and sustainer, is relational, then this will be reflected in creation and will be present in the cells of which we are made and the very stuff from which the universe is constructed. If this is the case, then, like Nicodemus, knowing about God is not enough. It will never be enough. It is only through knowing God, being in relationship with God, that we can reach our full potential. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What if God is inviting us through Jesus in the power of the Spirit to enter into and develop that relationship, to become part of that divine community. To exist as relational beings, recognizing that it is God through whom we live and move and have our being. If God is doing that through Jesus, and as Christians, we, leave, we believe God is, if that is the invitation, how then can we respond? I want to share something else with you. You may have come across this. It is the Methodist way of life. A Methodist way of life is an approach to living built on what Methodists have always done. Since the days of John Wesley in trying to follow Jesus and live out the Christian faith. It provides a set of commitments and practices that encourage and equip people better to live a Christian life, recognizing our daily need to connect with God. Fullness of life is part of God's will for all humanity. A Methodist way of life is intended to help everyone be transformed in their attitudes and habits and to discover what that means both in their inner lives and in their relationships with fellow humans. This card lays out the commitments and practices that we can follow as we seek to live our lives in response to God's love made known to us in Jesus. Most importantly, this is a shared enterprise. We do it with others. It helps us develop regular rhythmical patterns of discipleship and mission, which enable us to deepen our relationship with God and one another and I commend it to you. I wonder if this Trinity Sunday or whenever it is that you watch this recording of the sermon, I wonder if there is some way in your church, 
or your circuit, that people could be enabled to explore this approach as a means to grow in fellowship with one another, but especially to grow in fellowship with God. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Let us pray. Heavenly One, you are beyond all knowledge and yet known to us. You are outside of our experience and yet deep within us. We commit ourselves anew to follow your will and to work towards your purposes that all the world might be transformed for the benefit of all creation. Amen.